today about a couple of uh, big topics in the assembly planning sphere of cognitive robotics. So here is the um, problem statement that we use to guide our uh, research into assembly planning, which is given a system of objects with geometric and spatial properties, how do we can develop a configuration to achieve some goal or satisfy some notion of optimality? And you'll notice this is pretty broad. Assembly planning is a, is a very wide sphere, but at its heart is really this idea of literally assembly. Like you have a bunch of disparate pieces, how do you bring them together to achieve some task? Uh, so here are some examples of assembly planning problems from uh, simple to complex. Right here we have Tetris, where the problem is given one, one piece, one shape at a time, how do we arrange the pieces into complete rows? Then we have a bit more complex example. We have a Lego Millennium Falcon here. And the question here is given a box set of pieces that together can form this shape, maybe you've lost the directions, how do you uh, combine the pieces to make Millennium Falcon? And then in the far right, we have a much, much more complicated version of the problem that says, you know, given this, this part space of all the current technologies available, how do we develop a Mars rover that can uh, travel on Mars and collect scientific data? Okay, so you can see here, so the wide range of problems in, the, in this sphere and how complicated they can be. So what makes assembly planning difficult? Well, um, just considering which parts you pick alone is combinatorial, right? And how you combine those parts can be continuous. Uh, some problems are discretized. The Tetris problem and the uh, Lego problem both are discretized, but um, that's not always the case. And discretization can be very costly or limiting. These problems often lack characteristics and they can be difficult to find intuitive solutions for. Um, these are problems that are difficult even for humans. If you ever heard of someone joke about how hard it is to assemble you know, an IKEA couch, um, this is why, because uh, assembly problems are, are difficult even for um, complex problem solving brains. And they often require very complex considerations beyond just the assembly. Feasibility, stability, safety. If you think of Mars rover and how many considerations are involved in that, uh, you'll get an idea of how complex these problems can be. Um, so we decide to address two big uh, questions in the assembly planning sphere. The first is assembly sequence planning, which is this question of given a, uh, the design for some complete structure, how can we develop a specific plan of how to assemble that structure or disassemble that structure part by part? And the second is the bin packing problem, which says, given a space and a number of uh, spatial objects, how can we fit those objects in that space? If they don't all fit, how do we pick which ones that do fit? Okay. So uh, what is assembly sequence planning, or ASP? Well, consider this uh, diagram of a, of a drill right here. All the information you might need to assemble the drill could be actually available in this diagram, but doesn't actually give you a clear idea of how to go from something disassembled to something assembled. If you're not, if you don't have a plan about it, if you're not being efficient in your choices, it can take you much longer than it needs to to assemble this drill. And as uh, configurations become more complex and involve more parts, this becomes more and more vital that you have a actual step-by-step -step plan of how to go from disassembled to assembled or vice versa. Uh, so how does this apply to Mark Watney? Well, if you uh, remember towards the end of the book, we had this problem, right? where Watney's spaceship does not enough, have enough fuel to take him off Mars. So what we have is one malnourished man in EVA suit, 45 days and minimal tools, and what we need is a partially disassembled ship that's still functional, under a weight threshold, and still safe, right? So uh, here we can see how vitally important it is to Watney that he has an efficient plan for disassembling this spaceship, right? Because if he's not efficient about how he spends his time, what parts he takes off when, he could not be able to uh, completely disassemble or reach the weight threshold in the amount of time he has to make it on it, make his escape from Mars. Okay. So can we develop an intelligent robotic system to help him do this? That is the question I'm trying to answer. What about the bin packing problem? So the utility here is a lot more uh, clear, I think, because it's something we deal with every day. You know, just packing your backpack, packing a suitcase, trying to bring the groceries from your car to your apartment in one trip. Um, this is a this is a, a very widespread problem. Um, it's the, at the heart of it is this notion of uh, efficiency, packing as much stuff as you can to a limited space. And there's this additional question of if you can't pack everything, how do you choose what to pack? How do you reach some notion of optimality? And while this may seem like an easy question at first, it's actually quite complicated, especially in higher dimensions. So how does this apply to Mark Watney? Well, uh, throughout this, the middle of the book. He's traveling from his original habitat to the ship that's supposed to take him off Mars. 
and uh, he needs to take everything that he needs to survive with him in the rover. It needs to be on, in, or attached to the rover. So uh, how do we help him pick what to pack, since he can't pack everything, and how do we decide where to pack it? This is a very important problem for him, and that's what we're going to be trying to solve uh, in this lecture. So just uh, to recap really quickly, the two big problems we're going to be talking about are assembly sequence planning, which is developing a plan step by step of how to assemble or disassemble an object, and the packing problem, which is how to pack all the objects into a space. So uh, this is our outline. We started with the assembly planning introduction. Uh, we're done with that. So first we're going to go into the ASP problem and the algorithm we decided to study in depth, which is ant colony optimization. Uh, and then we're going to be talking about the big packing problem and the levels of complexity there and some solutions to that problem. Okay, so uh, we'll start with ASP. So here's the problem statement. Given a system of assembled parts and rule dependencies, how can we develop an ordered disassembly plan that satisfies some notion of optimality? And you notice here we're talking about disassembly specifically. So the general paradigm in this, in this uh, problem is that it's easier to disassemble something than to assemble something. And uh, if you have an optimal plan or efficient plan to disassemble a structure, you can make an optimal assembly plan by just doing that in reverse. So before we talk about the algorithm, we decide to study in depth. Uh, there's a couple of other uh, <coughs> options we uh, looked at briefly. So um, the first is planning primarily through ge geometric reasoning, which are um, approaches that generally require a CAD model. Uh, so you input a CAD model to a system, it does the search based on the CAD model. Um, these are good approaches. We decided not to pursue them because a lot of the geometric reasoning is done within the CAD model, and we want to really see how that's done and get our hands dirty with it. So we decided to go with something a little bit more fundamental. Um, divide and conquer approaches. So say you have a big, um, complicated structure. Can you identify substructures in the overall structure that you can uh, disassemble independently and thereby simplify the, the bigger problem? This is a great approach. You can use it in conjunction with other, with other methods as well. Um, we decided not to pursue this uh, more thoroughly because um, we, it doesn't actually give you the disassembly plan, just ways of breaking up. We want to see really how those, these plans are made. And then there are genetic algorithms. These usually involve some expert um, with a number of initial solutions to the assembly planning problem, or the assembly sequence planning problem. They'll input it as the uh, first generation in genetic algorithm search, and then it'll, you'll do the genetic search based on that. Um, we decided not to pursue this because genetic algorithms aren't really unique to this problem. We want something a little more unique, and also they require um, initial solutions. So we want to see what happens if you don't have those. So the algorithm we're studying is called ant colony optimization, ACO. It's graph-based, which should be very familiar to us. We do a lot of graph-based problems. Um, the solutions are optimal and optimal. They handle single and multiple objectives, and they do not require a capital. Okay. So uh, ant colony optimization is, unsurprisingly, inspired by ants. The general idea here is that you have a group of ants searching a space, let's say they come upon a piece of food, um, they'll all grab the food and travel back to the nest. And as they travel, they'll leave down a pheromone trail. And other ants that find this trail will be inclined to follow it. They'll follow, they might follow the trail, find more food, grab it, bring it back to the nest, and lay down additional pheromones. So we have this positive reinforcement loop where uh, good paths get more and more pheromone. Um, and that inclines more ants to follow it and increase the pheromone levels. So that's what we're going to try to leverage in this implementation. So here's a quick overview of the uh, method in general. It's the shortest pathfinding algorithm uh, that operates on graphs. It's what makes it different from an algorithm like A star, for example, is that it's best for tours. So rather than answering the question of I'm at point A, I want to get to point B, it's great for answering the question of I want to visit all these points, how can I do so in an efficient manner? Uh, many of you might recognize this as the traveling salesman problem, which is a pretty uh, common problem in CS. Um, Assembly sequence planning is actually a constrained version of the traveling salesman problem, so, which we'll, we'll get into in a second. Um, but the final solutions outputs are optimal and optimal sequences, and it'll, ultimate, it'll output a sequence for each potential starting location in the graph. So we'll go through a quick example uh, of ACO in the traveling salesman context before we go into the more complex implementation in terms of assembly sequence planning. So let's say we have these four points and we're going, we want to find an efficient plan to travel through them. We're going to list these four ants to help us. 
So the first step is to assign each ant a starting location. So one location for each ant. Um, and then each ant is going to be operating in tandem. So we're just going to focus on this guy right here, ant number A. But remember that all the other ants will be doing the same thing as he does the search. Okay. So his first uh, first goal is to pick the next location to go to. And he has two considerations. The first is this heuristic value here. So we're trying to minimize distance. So we'll say this heuristic is, is uh, related to the distance between two points. Right? So he's inclined to pick paths that have low heuristic values. Uh, the second consideration is the pheromone trail. And that's represented by the thickness of these arrows. So this edge from A to C has the least pheromone, and this edge from A to B has the most pheromone. Okay? So uh, what he'll do is he'll look at his options based on the heuristic values and the pheromone values, and he'll assign probabilities to each choice. And he'll pick his next choice probabilistically. So let's say he uh, picks the most appealing choice, which is this edge from A to B. So what we're going to do is we're going to move him to node B. And then we're actually going to decay this pheromone trail that he just traveled. So I said when I was talking about the inspiration for this algorithm that ants lay down pheromone trails as they travel. Does anyone know why we might decay this trail instead of reinforcing it? Any thoughts? It's kind of a subtle point. So as, as he's moving, all the other ants are moving too, right? And if a number of other ants also reach point A, this is the most appealing path, and if they all take this path, that might not be as interesting to us. So we want to encourage exploration for other ants in the cycle. So we decay this pheromone trail to discourage future ants from taking the same path within the cycle. Okay? So maybe you said this before, but can you say a little bit more about, so why is it appealing to take the same the path? Oh, because so this for was, example, in, in A star, we don't want to take the same path. So this was, this was an appeal, oops, going our way. This was an appealing uh, path because it has a high pheromone level and a low heuristic, right? So other ants that see this, they'll also see a high pheromone level and a low heuristic. Um, but we want them to explore, we want them to see different things. We don't want to touch the heuristic value because that's intrinsic, intrinsic to the actual space, uh, but we can change the pheromone levels. So we do this just to discourage future uh, ants from doing the exact same thing. Does that answer your question? Okay. Okay. Oops. So uh, he's at point B. We've decayed this pheromone trail. Um, now we're just going to do the same thing at each of these following points. We're just going to uh, step through that really quickly to save time. So we went from A to B. And let's say it goes from B to C and then C to D. So now we evaluate uh, the quality of this path. Let's say it had a total path length of three. Okay. And we consider this to be good. So um, this is a good path. So we want to assign a lot of pheromone to the just that I traveled to reflect that. So we'll add in these extra big arrows to the pheromone. Okay, and all the other ants are doing this for their own path as well. So if they took a bad path, you would add less pheromone to their edges. And we're also going to decay the pheromone levels of all the paths in the uh, graph. So paths that are good and were traveled will get more pheromones, um, and they will have more pheromone than was decayed. And paths that were bad or weren't traveled will become less appealing with time. And then we rinse and repeat. So we start the cycle over again. Each ant resets to its starting position, and we do the search all over again. And once it's done, each ant will output the best path that it found throughout its search. Okay. So how can we modify this method to aid in assembly sequence planning? Uh, well, here's the uh, pseudocode for this. Uh, I'm just going to step through it very briefly. So you generate initial feasible moves for a set number of cycles. You reset the ant's position when they start their tour. You generate candidate moves. Select the next move, update the positions, perform the pheromone updates, then you evaluate the solution, do the global updates, and you repeat. So can anyone tell me what's different here than in the traveling salesman problem we just did? There's this additional notion of uh, feasibility here, right? Where in the traveling salesman problem, you can go from any point to any other point, but in assembly sequence planning, that's not the case, right? Uh, you can't take any part off at any time. There's constraints here. So the main difference between the traveling salesman problem and ASP is that there's this additional notion of dependencies and prior rule dependencies. So that's that's what we're going to be uh, adding to the algorithm. And then if I was solving, for example, a logistic uh, a vehicle routing with capacity constraints, mm -hmm. then this would be 
this would also be true. Right? So you have yes. constraints that the truck can't handle carry more than a load of some amount. Yes, yes. Okay, so there's a couple assumptions we're gonna make, uh, pretty, pretty standard assumptions for this type of problem. The first is that all part removals are deterministic and constant, just to simplify uh, the way we evaluate our paths. Um, all products contain all parts, so there's no surprises when we do our disassembly. Um, we're gonna assume we do a complete disassembly for everything that we ev evaluate, and we're not gonna violate the precedence constraints. So there's two big additions to the algorithm for ASP. The first is this concept of disassembly operations or dues. And the idea here is that we're taking, we're numbering each part in the system, and we're gonna split it into six nodes. And these are gonna be the nodes in our graph. So um, each do represents a part in a direction. So this part, this, this do right here, one positive Z, is, represents the removal of part one in the positive Z direction. And we have six directions here, so positive and negative x, y, and z. We also have uh, the most important part of the algorithm, which is the disassembly matrix, or DM. So it defines the interference relationship between components. It's, a n by n, it's an n by 3n matrix. We actually, in our implementation, in our example, model it as a n by n by 3 matrix to make it a little more uh, intuitive. And the way it works is index a, b, k represents part whether or not part B interferes with the removal of part A in the K direction. So if we want to see if uh, part two is pre prevented from being removed in the Z direction by part three, we go to part two, we go to part three, check the Z direction, we see zero here, so we know there's no interference there. Uh, so you might notice there's only three directions when we're doing a six directional analysis. Any thoughts on why that is? Why do we only need three directions? So there's this notion of symmetry here, where if you can remove part A from part B in the positive x direction, that's the same as removing part B from part A in the negative x. Right? So when Jerry goes through his example, we'll illustrate how you actually pick which operations are feasible, and we'll go over that in detail. <coughs> and then you remove parts from the system. <coughs> yes? So are there uh, the constraints taking into account already? Because, for example, if you look at a car engine, for example, there may be cases where you can remove one part in the positive direction, but the same part uh, on the, you cannot remove it in the negative direction because there's a space constraint or something. Yes, so that, the, those constraints are taken account here, and they will be also t in the account, taken into account for the negative directions. So that, that, that will just then give a dependence in the set direction, right? It will not distinguish between plus and minus. Yeah, so uh, when, you're, when you're evaluating removal in the positive direction, Jerry will go through this in detail, okay. but essentially what you do is you sum across the row. So you want to see if you can remove part three in the positive z direction. You'll sum here, and if you have any ones, then it's, there's a constraint there. If you want to see in the negative z direction, you sum down the column, and uh, you check these indices. And there's a one here, so there's a interference there. But Jerry will go, go through that in depth. Yes. And then as you remove parts, you can either, uh, Oh, yes. Thank you. Is there any like angle consideration or just? No, there is not here. You can add more dimensions if you so choose, um, which will just add a uh, constant time I think, to the actual algorithm. So it's not, it's not very costly, but this is just uh, the way the example is done. Um, anyways, any, sorry, any other questions? So um, as you remove parts, you either set the relevant indices to zero, say you remove part two, you just set um, all these interferences to zero. And, or you can actually shrink the matrix, which will make it run faster as time goes on, but can be hard to keep track of which part is which. And then we have the pheromone and the heuristic matrices. These uh, operate exactly as they did in the traveling salesman problem. Um, the pheromone matrix weights connections between nodes, um, just like in the uh, TSP problem. The heuristic matrix operates the same. So our goal in our, our sample problem and our implementation is to minimize the number of orientation changes when we're um, disassembling a product. So if you're removing something in the Z direction, you want to keep removing as many things as possible in the Z direction without you know, changing around. So we set the heuristic between uh, two do's as one, if they share a direction, and point two otherwise. So can anyone tell me when this might be a good heuristic and if it would work well from our body?
Yes. I guess for the like, bigger and heavier parts, then minimizing orientation changes might be convenient. Um, not quite, because it's not it's not orientation as it's moving away from parts. It's just what direction it's taking the part. From. So this this is a good heuristic because you don't need any additional information, right? Everything you need to pick the heuristic values is in the nature of the dues. It's also good for manufacturing, where for robotic arm, slight chain moves in one direction might be easy, but these big moves, so like change the rotation of the arm, might be more costly. And if you're just assembling thousands of parts a day, um, that could add up. It would probably not work well for Mark Watney, right? Because he can just sit in place and move his arm around pretty easily. But if he wants to keep moving parts in one direction, he might have to walk all around the ship to do that. And um, that's not really efficient for him. So some heuristics that might work well for him um, in this algorithm might be distance between two parts. So does he have to travel very far to take apart two different pieces of the ship? Or um, whether two parts require the same tool? So does he have to keep going back to his toolbox or um, changing what he has to do the disassembly? Okay, so here's the final algorithm with a little bit more detail, and then Jerry's gonna go to an example. Um, first, we generate the initial feasible dues from the initial disassembly matrix. Then for uh, each cycle, we reset the answer position, and they start their tour, they generate candidate moves from the disassembly matrix, select the next move, they update their position and the <coughs> matrix, decay the pheromones, and they evaluate their final path, add pheromones, decay pheromones, and then you start over. And eventually when you're done, each ant will output the best disassembly sequence that it found. Okay. So I will hand it off to Jerry. Great. <coughs> Hi everybody, I'm Jerry. Um, and so I'm gonna take you through a quick example of ant calling optimization. As you saw previously, that's the picture that we saw during Jacob's slides, and we're gonna go through exactly how it would work to take apart this uh, very small four-part assembly. So as you see, we're given an assembly with four parts, they're each numbered, and there's a set of XYZ coordinates. And the first step that we'll go through is to try to generate the disassembly matrix. So if we were given the set of dependencies and uh, precedence relationships, then we wouldn't have to worry about like figuring out all the interferences. But since it's four parts, we can kind of figure out fairly easily that you know if we stuck part one deep down into all the other parts, we wouldn't be able to slide part two out, and part one would also not be able to continue pushing downwards, right? So there would be interference in like the positive x, positive y, and for part one, it wouldn't be able to move in the next z direction, among other things, right? And from all this information, we're able to generate the disassembly matrix. And so that looks something like this. Right? And as Jacob went through earlier, based on the disassembly matrix, we're able to find specific indices that we care about to figure out our feasible dues. Um, specifically, if we wanted to figure out the feasible dues in the positive direction, we look down a row. And as Jacob said earlier, right, we look at the indexes corris indices corresponding to like positive z, for instance. And since there are zeros all along the row, that means part one can be moved in the positive z direction. Does that make sense? Everybody can see how it can move upwards? Right, cool. And then part four can be moved in the negative z direction, as indicated by the fact that the zeros all down the column. Right. This is all very intuitive, it makes a lot of sense, you're all very smart, so I don't have to worry about that too much. Great. And so now we've kind of found our feasible dues, and we can kind of move on with the rest of the actual optimization. And so this is kind of just the initialization step. And so for the next part, right, we take our feasible dues, and we stick cute little ants on them, just like before. And for the sake of this example, we're also going to follow only one ant, just to make things very clear. And so this is the part where I ask that you don't fall asleep because there's going to be a lot of like equations and math that shows up. But I'm going to do my best to keep it entertaining. All right, great. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take <coughs> part one and we're going to move it upwards. Right? We're going to commit the DO. And after it's removed, we can recalculate the disassembly matrix, right? Because part one imposed a certain number of constraints on the rest of the assembly. And so from that, we can recalculate the disassembly matrix. In this case, I shrunk it down just so we don't have to look at a column of uh, zeros and a row of zeros. And so you can see that part one imposed a ton of uh, uh, constraints on the rest of the parts. <clears throat> and so based on these new constraints that each of these parts have, we see a bunch of columns of zeros, a bunch of rows of zeros, right? We can find a new set of DOs that this ant can travel to, right? 
And so, of course, there's actually more than four options. I chose only four options here for the sake of it not looking too messy. And based on these four options, we can kind of calculate the probability. And this is the part where everyone's eyes glaze over. Um, so this is the probability of going from node i to node j, where each node is represented by like the disassembly operation. And so the first thing we're going to do go through is kind of talk about how each pro how probability is calculated and kind of deal with the very nitty gritty of this algorithm. Cool. So the first uh, variable that we should care about is the variable tau. And I'm going to keep a running key in the top right so that you don't actually have to pay too much attention and you can kind of zone in and out whenever you want. So the first thing we care about, like Jacob said, is the pheromones, right? Tau represents how much pheromone is deposited along that trail from node i to node j. And then the second thing we care about is the heuristic, which is eta. In this case, it's the reorientations, right? Uh, the reorientations of parts. That said, it could be substituted for anything else we care about should you have another heuristic. And I'll be actually going in, deep, or in depth about that later. And then there's also the weighting of the heuristic versus the pheromone. It's not necessary that you have to care about them at a one-to-one -one ratio or that you even care about the pheromone that much at all, you might just weight your heuristic completely, right? And so beta would be how you modify that. Now that said, this is only for, J, for nodes that are possible to reach from the current node you're at. You can imagine uh, the nodes that we're missing. There are nodes that cannot be reached from moving part one in the positive z direction, such as moving part one in the positive x direction, right? you don't necessarily want to remove a part that you've already removed, which is something that is very uh, sensical that we didn't go to in depth for because it's very logical, right? And then otherwise, of course, for those parts, the probability is zero. Yes? Um, is there a specific reason why uh, beta is, is uh, an exponent and not, uh, like if you weight them, you would probably have something like one minus beta as a weighting factor, um, but, but here it's exponential. It's uh, not specifically presented in the paper, but it was just that way in the equations. Um, I can imagine you could do a different uh, weighting scheme, and it'll probably end up just fine. Skylar, do you have to see? Yeah, I would guess that having an exponential weighting is somewhat good because it means that by keeping it all multiplicative, you're not too dependent on the actual magnitude of the pheromones. Like, it, you're dividing by the sum of them, like basically. Whereas if you have a uh, like a linear combination, then if the pheromone levels are all generally low or high, they're either going to be irrelevant or kind of dominate. Cool. Great. And so from that, we've got a probability. And so we can say, for instance, that the probabilities are calculated as such. I didn't give exact pheromone values because those are fairly unimportant for this example. But let's say that the highest probability is moving part two in the positive z direction. And so the ant moves there randomly, and it is now the new DO that it can commit to, and then it does the update to the pheromone matrix. Another equation, cool. So like I said before, tau is the pheromone value across the trail, and we have, all we've done is introduce uh, a new variable, rho, and rho is kind of a local evaporation. So it's like Jacob said earlier, we're trying to avoid this kind of immediate convergence onto a single path. We want our ants to explore outwards. So we're decaying down the pheromone trail down to this very new specific value listed, which is tau naught, what we initialize all the pheromone trail values to, right? Because they're not going to be initialized to zero, because otherwise the probability of going to any path would be zero, right? Great. Any questions so far? Crickets? Great. Perfect. Uh, and so now we just refresh and we do it all over again, right? We have to keep going until we've gotten rid of every single part, right? And so now the ant has reached the goal and we're not done because this is an iterative process, right? So we have to start this over again. And we keep doing this and doing a kind of global update for the pheromone trail at the end of every cycle. And so that would be referring to this equation, which is a bit longer, and more complicated than the local decaying kind of uh, pheromone trail. And this represents a new decay function, or decay variable, which is gamma, very similar to rho, it just decays the value of the pheromone trail. 
to value between one and zero. And then afterwards, we deposit pheromone to the pheromone trail uh, based on the number of ants and a very specific path they took and how many reorientations they took along that path. Q is just some constant. Great. Feeling good still? Cool. And so you can imagine some possible outcome of this uh, example being that ant one, for example, moves from one in the positive z direction, two to the positive x direction, three to the positive y direction, etc. And then over time, after running this a certain number of cycles, those weirder uh, DOs that are using reorientations would eventually become <coughs> things that we can expect where there are no reorientations because they would cater to the heuristic and they become more likely over time, right? Great. And so for the implementation of this uh, algorithm, we couldn't find a schematic of a spaceship. So since there are very similar things <coughs> in uh, an Ikea song and dresser, we use that. It has 116 parts and you know, it makes a lot of sense. This is an IKEA SpaceX collaboration. Uh, you know, <laughs> if they're down to us, you know, sponsor this presentation, we'd be very happy to accept that. Uh, anyways, uh, so for the implementation, which is also something you'll have to deal with on the homework, uh, a very important thing that we also haven't touched on yet is that you have to figure out how part one, some arbitrary part one, imposes constraints on some other arbitrary part two, and what directions and cons uh, considerations you have to make about those constraints, right? And so specifically, uh, this is mainly a slide to help you with your homework. Uh, if you want to impose constraints from part one onto part two, then you should list it as such, and I think this is how it's going to be done on the homework. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Oh. Yeah, the homework, is, this would be kind of cool to put in the homework, so uh, it's a little simpler in the homework. Okay, so then this is actually just how yeah. we did it. We just, uh, and the homework is just like the straightforward disassembly matrix, not the constraints. So. Okay, cool. All right, so the next thing is the output of the implementation. And so there are two things we really want to note on this, right? On the right side, we can see a bunch of small parts, right? It's a small screw, small locks, etc. And then on the... Oh. My right side, sorry. Uh, something else to note, it's uh, yes. down columns first. Like it's go down. Oh yes, column, it goes from right. top, top down, door, left, top right. left, all the way to the bottom right. And so you can see on the left, it starts with small items, and then it goes towards these larger items, right? And this is the same exact way that we would imagine this disassembly, taking apart a uh, IKEA song dresser. And so that's great. Uh, we've solved that problem. But there's actually much more realistic circumstances that exist in the real world. We don't, yes? Uh, this is, might be a very silly question, but so your dis like the whole algorithm bases on like disassembling right. this big structure. Mm -hmm. How did you like uh, generate the assembly in the first place? You know, oh, so you're expected to have the assembly. You have to have, have, to have an assembly. Okay. Yes, yes. Because okay. otherwise that becomes a very difficult problem. So elements fixed in place, if you remove other elements, is that like an assumption that we make? The, oh, yes. 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 Okay. yes. So, so if, if you like take off, yes, and I see exactly where you're going with this, right? Like, so if you take off the bottom, then you're expecting everything else to flow in space. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so the, that's a key thing that we should actually talk about right now. The output of these algorithms is usually expected to have an expert who's alongside the project evaluate whether or not the actual disassembly operation is feasible. And so that is something that needs to be taken into account whenever you do this uh, optimization. Cool. And so realistically, we don't have just multiple objectives. And realistically, realistically we also don't even have a single agent. We have multiple agents, right? Uh, the ant colony optimization is really good for one part, oh, for one product, one part at a time, with one person. Um, but there's a lot of circumstances that don't re that require something more sophisticated and something that's more repeatable, right? So things like disassembly of cars, disassembly of hazardous product projects uh, require a very intuitive disassembly line that's optimized for a lot of different things. And so that's kind of the thing that we're going to talk about next with uh, multi-objective ant colony optimization. Uh, and that's kind of a mouthful, so we'll call it MOACO. And so it 
maintains the benefits of ACO. It's fast, it returns these optimal or near optimal solutions, and it can also uh, be adapted to deal with heuristics. And then in addition to that, it's able to uh, deal with multiple heuristics and this idea of multiple agents. And by multiple agents, what I really mean is that if you have an assembly line, then <coughs> each step in the assembly line is a different agent, right? Because each agent is taking apart one part from the product every single time as a new product moves down the line. Does that make sense? I see nods. All right, cool. And so the next, the other, there are other objectives that I can try to take into account, such as minimizing those number of agents, right? Uh, balancing the part removal sequence, prioritizing these kind of other kinds classified parts, such as hazardous parts or high demand parts. And then in addition, it has some benefits, uh, in addition to the benefits offered by ACO, which is that its optimality increases with the number of constraints, and it's suited to integer problems, and it allows for multiple agents. Cool, so now we'll keep going. And so, based on the assumptions that we already made from ACO, we have additional assumptions we need to make for MOACO, which are that each part, like I said before, is assigned to one and only one workstation. Uh, the part times are not all the same, right? So taking apart one part is not necessarily as t the same as taking apart a different part. Um, and that makes perfect sense, right? If you're taking a screw out versus removing a shelf, it's very different and that the sum of the part removal times must not exceed some predetermined cycle time. You don't want to have everything hanging on a single workstation. Great. And so, because we have these new objectives we care about, we have to introduce these new cost functions. Uh, and so, one of the problems that we're trying to address is the disassembly line balancing problem. <coughs> and so that requires Four, five specific cost functions, four specific cost functions, uh, but I'll introduce five different kinds, two of which are redundant. So the first one is kind of minimizing the workstation idle times, where each workstation is removing a certain piece, and we want to minimize the amount of time that they're down for. And so CT is the cycle time, ST is the time that it's spending removing a certain part. And for the sake of the same thing as before, there's a little key in the bottom right. You don't have to pay too much attention. And we'll kind of refer to these uh, cost functions as something more specific than just Z1, Z2, et cetera. Great, so the first thing is the objective function for the workstation uh, downtime. Uh, the second function is a similar function, but it's a nonlinear version of that. Uh, the third one would be something to deal with hazardous parts, where each hazardous part is given a certain hazardous part value. And depending on when it's removed in the part sequence, there's a certain uh, K value assigned to it. So if it's a hazardous part and it's removed and as the first part in the part sequence, then its K value would be one. And from that, you can kind of seek to minimize that value. And then there's also prioritizing high demand parts. Similar to the hazardous parts value, we assign high demand parts a certain D value, and then we kind of give it a K value based on when it's disassembled. And then lastly, we want to minimize the changes in removal orientation. And so every single time we uh, increase the number, number of reorientations, we increment up R. Great. I think that covers all of those. And so rather than go through all of ACO again, uh, I'm just going to talk about what we changed from the last few equations so that we can just knock this out and move on to bin packing. Great. So the first thing is the probability equation. So tau is just like before, it's pheromones. <laughs> Eta is, a, is the heuristic, and since our heuristic has changed, so does eta. So instead of eta being some arbitrary value about uh, reorientations, we have it specifically about one objective function. In this algorithm that we looked at, it does a kind of greedy search in that it looks only at the objective function for workstation cooldown, which is possible to change. You can make it so that there's a hierarchy. The main point of the disassembly line balancing problem is that you're trying to balance out the disassembly line. And so since that is by default the highest priority, we end up balancing about this. Cool. And then the next thing is the uh, pheromone update. So we don't use this equation anymore. And instead, we do the singular update, and we 
change only one specific thing about the pheromone deposited, right? So if you remember before, it was about reorientations plus one, which now that doesn't make sense because we have a bunch of heuristics. And so we kind of have to follow this hierarchy where we have this uh, L value and L follows down this hierarchy of if the cost fu objective function matches for a path, then it just keeps going down the hierarchy of cost functions, right? Sound good? Cool. And so, of course, this is not without problems. Uh, ACO and MOACO both require a significant amount of setup, right? You have to have the uh, disassembly matrix and understand the precedence relationships. And neither of these algorithms really take into account reorientation time or the motion required for part removal. Like, like uh, I don't know your name, but what you said before about like having a very heavy part versus a very light part, it doesn't actually take into account the amount of motion that would be required to move a large part rather than a small screw. Um, and then it also doesn't take into account complex motions like screwing and, or even uh, additional part removal directions for very complex parts, right? Like an actual car does not only move in XYZ space. <coughs> Great. But in conclusion, right, we presented ACO and MOACO, which are these graphical optimal methods, which can solve for heuristic objectives, are applicable to real life circumstances, and they're capable of solving MP hard problems through this probabilistic heuristic approach. And so next, Rachel will be taking you through the second problem of our uh, lecture, which is the packing problem. Great, thank you, Jess. So moving on to the packing problem. So first, you know, uh, Jerry and Jacob described to us if we have, um, you know, an already completed like part, tool, object, how do we take it apart? But now the question is, if we have a bunch of different things, how do we fit them all together in a container? And specifically, um, oops, that's the wrong way, sorry. Specifically for Watney, he needed to modify his rover to, in order to fit the RTG unit to keep him warm, all of his food. And if you notice, there's a hole with a balloon in the top, right? And I'm pretty sure he needed that to make room for everything. Um, so basically, uh, just a reminder of what the pack of our packing problem is, is that Watney needs to modify the rover to fit all of the required components in food while also maximizing his drive time. And you can kind of see the obvious trade-off. The more room that he uses for solar panels to help him drive farther and faster, the less room he has for life-saving equipment. So in general, kind of a classic description of the packing problem is how can we arrange different components together to fit within a specified space or volume? And so in general, packing problems are combinatorial optimization problems, which kind of sounds scary, uh, but there have been solutions for it. Um, and uh, the goal is to find a good arrangement of multiple objects, whether you're looking in one, two, or three dimensions, while minimizing the wasted area left over in the container. And for most of these examples that we're going to look at, um, we'll be looking at rectangular objects. Uh, it's a little simpler to, to deal with and understand. And there are variations, more variations for irregular shapes, but they're a little complicated. And this is just an introduction. So we can talk about those later if you'd like. But in general, the main problem statement is given a set of objects with either regular or irregular shapes, and by regular I mean cuboid type shapes, um, and a regular slash irregular container, find the set of objects that can be arranged in the container without any overlap, such that the value of unused area in the container is minimized. Um, and so in general, the packing problem is kind of divided broadly into three classes. The first is that maybe the number of containers is fixed, and you need to pack as many objects as possible into the fixed number of containers. The second class is the number of objects is fixed, and so the goal is to pack um, all of the objects into a minimum number of containers. And then the third is that both the number of objects and the number of containers are fixed. And in this case, maybe the objects are given a weight, and you need to find the maximum like weight example for, for, um, for like maybe value of the objects that are contained within the fixed number of boxes. And so uh, the next question is, how do we choose which bins to, play, uh, to place and in what location uh, do we place the objects in the bins? 
And so, in general, as I mentioned before, it's an NP-hard combinatorial op optimization problem. And there are exact algorithms that do solve for optimal solutions every time. Um, and one example is mixed integer and linear programming. There's also like branch and bound techniques. But in one paper that I read, it only contained three containers, six boxes, and it took 15 minutes to find a solution, which doesn't sound very efficient. So many, um, <coughs> there are also many, many variations on a theme for this. There's single versus multiple containers. You know, if you have three trucks, you have to fill one truck. And there's also different sizes. Do you have just a square rectangle that you have to fill? Is it like some weird shape like Watney's Rover? Um, and there's also uh, different size boxes. Do you have boxes that are all the same size, boxes with different size? There's so many different problems. Are you going to allow rotations? Is stability considered? There's a lot of variations. And as we go through this presentation, if you think to yourself, hmm, I wonder if this heuristic has been tried with this other algorithm with this different type of box, the answer is probably. This has been a very worked on problem for a very long time. And so this is just a kind of general overview of some of the more popular and well-known methods. Um, so because the exact problem is not super efficient, kind of hard to solve, um, approximation algorithms are typically used. And so just kind of a reminder, an approximation algorithm uh, t uh, is an efficient algorithm that approximates the solutions to NB hard optimization problems. Uh, with provable guarantees on the distance of the return solution to the optimal one. And in kind of plain English, it's, it approximates a solution that's going to be pretty close to optimal, but not guaranteed to be optimal. Um, and so um, there are main ways that this is done about in literature, and uh, the two main, there are heuristic approaches, and the two types of heuristics are construction-based and then meta-heuristics. And this is actually what I'll be talking about for the rest of my time up here. So in general, we have so approximation. So okay. you're going to talk about both construction-based and meta, or just meta? Both. OK, cool. It's going to be great. <laughs> um, so just in general, we have uh, in the category of approximation algorithm heuristics, we have the construction-based heuristics. And uh, these typically consist of first fit and its flavors, next fit, best fit, and worst fit. And I'll talk about what all these specifically mean here in a moment. But also keep in mind, right, this is an overview. There are many other flavors that kind of go in here, but these are the most common ones. Um, and in general, next fit decreasing, which I'll talk about in a moment, is the best in terms of speed of packing, in terms of how fast it can find, find a solution. But best fit decreasing is the most efficient in packing. It, it gives you the, the most efficiently packed system. And so there are trade-offs with all of these algorithms. Um, and then on the category of meta heuristics, this is where we kind of get into the more intelligent side. So um, typically, the genetic algorithm simulated annealing and taboo search uh, flavors are the most commonly applied meta heuristics to solving the bin packing problem. And so, how do these heuristics actually apply to the bin packing problems of different dimensions? So, we're going to start, uh, there's, you can solve you know, bin packing problem in 1, 2, and 3D. So in 1D, you have typically um, you know, common sized uh, rectangular like containers such as like this, and they're all very uniform. Basically, they look like lines, right? One dimension. So they're typically simple to understand, and this is how we're going to start off the learning about the algorithms. Um, and they're typically solved just with construction heuristics. You don't really need to apply you know, a genetic algorithm to solve a 1D packing problem. You can, but you don't really need to. Um, but in this case, it's not super relevant to Mark Watney's problem. There's also the two-dimensional case, which is a bit more uh, interesting. You can be solved um, using variations of the construction techniques and meta heuristics that I mentioned before. Um, it's closer to Watney's problem, and you can see that it's a bit more interesting. Uh, and there's also 3D. And in this case, the search space is both continuous and discrete elements. Um, and you can kind of see that physics and stability are much more relevant in the 3D case than in the 2D case. Um, and they're typically solved most efficiently using combination of construction and meta heuristics. So, but in general, the 1D case is much too simple and the 3D case is pretty complex, but we'll build up to it. So perhaps a combination of these things can help solve Watney's problem. Let's learn about the basics of 1D packing to kind of build up our intuition about how these are solved. 
So in general, 1D, as I said before, is typically solved using these basic construction uh, heuristics. Um, and so the problem statement is given a collection of rectangular objects, we want to pack them into the minimum number of set size bins. And there's these four common main algorithms that I mentioned before. The first fit algorithm places a new object in the leftmost bin that still has room, right? You place it the first place where it fits. The next fit algorithm tries to place the object in the current bin, whatever that current bin is. If it's unsuccessful, it opens a new bin. The best fit algorithm places the new, a new object in the fullest bin that still has room. And the worst fit algorithm places a new object in the emptiest bin. Can I just clarify like, the terminology? So I think we've used like container, bin, box, and object. <laughs> so I think an object and a box go into a bin or a container, is that right? Yes, sorry for the miscommunication. That's yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly correct. So, so I'll say maybe <coughs> box or rectangle or object, those are the things that need to be packed. And container and bin are all the things that they go in. Thank you. <coughs> so um, in general, uh, we, have, we also have decreasing algorithms. And you can see that each, each of the main four categories has a decreasing variation. And in this case, you sort object, objects in non-increasing order with respect to their dimensions. So you basically place them in order, largest to smallest. Uh, and there's also lookup algorithms where a lookup table is kept to determine where similarly sized bins have, or similarly sized objects <laughs> have been placed in bins prior. So that way, if, if an object comes up, you can see where it's been placed before. Maybe there's more room for it to, to fill out the bin. So let's just take a look at the first fit algorithm. <coughs> so we want to plug the objects into, um, or into uh, bins <coughs> as they come into the next available space. So basically, you see here, first, this is our first um, object. It has its size three. And we want to plug it right into the, the first bin that's available. Our next one is one, and it fits in this first bin. So we plug it in. The six does not fit in the first bin because there would only be three left. So we move it to the next one. Four, similarly, can't fit in either of these two. Five, you have to move it to the next one. But then two, it fits into this first one that's available. So first fit decreasing. Firstly, you organize the objects in terms of size, and then you basically apply the first fit algorithm as normal. You, you plug them in as they come. So this one can fit in here. This one fits in there, down in here. This one can't fit in here, can't fit in here, but it can fit in here. And this one can fit in there, that one can fit in there. And you can see it's a bit more optimal, right? It only takes three bins. And so that's kind of the advantage of sorting all of your objects to be placed before putting them in. Uh, and there's also the best fit packing algorithm, where you want to leave the least room left over after the object has been placed. So in this case, um, we start off with three. And then if you can imagine all of these guys being empty, right? if we place this one here, it will technically leave the least room open. Here, we place the next one. And then it, uh, I think I had these swapped. Sorry, but, uh, but this one has to fit in here, followed by this one here, and then this one. To leave the least room, it fills up this bin. So that's kind of one of the variations of best fit. Um, why those not working? And all these algorithms are deterministic, right? Sorry, I'm not sure what you mean by that. So, so, so unless there's a tie break, it's always going to take the best. Oh, yeah. yes. Sorry, yes. All right. Well, that doesn't work. Okay. So, um, <coughs> oh, sorry. So this is supposed to be best fit decreasing. So just another example. First, we want to arrange them by size, and then we place them in the order that they've been, uh, in their decreasing order, in the place where they fill up. The, the, they leave the least room available at the end. And in this case, you can see it actually gives you the same result as for first fit decreasing. There are um, a bit more flavors and variations that become more apparent as the number of objects, the size of the objects change. But I felt like these gives you a really good overview. And so when you think of all of these construction heuristics like first fit, next fit, worst fit, best fit, 
Think of them as building blocks that are used in the future algorithms. And so now kind of moving on to 2D packing algorithms. So if we come back to this general breakdown of this, uh, 2D algorithms mainly focus on the other flavors while still using these four as main building blocks. The 2D case builds upon those and expands them into the 2D case. So um, just an example, like packing rectangles is commonly occurs in chip design. Um, and so in general, there's a few <coughs> different classes of, classes of algorithms as well. There's shelf algorithms, um, which is typically expanded versions of the 1D algorithms, which makes sense why the construction heuristics that I talked about a second ago are so important. Um, and you can see a picture here of you know, different shelves. Um, there's also guillotine algorithms. So if you've ever cut glass or like sheet metal, right, you can't just stop in the middle of the, of the sheet, right? That's not really how they cut. You have to cut all the way through. And that kind of cut is what's called a guillotine cut. And so you can see here, anytime a cut is made, it has to go all the way through the remaining space. So that's typically what, um, what a guillotine algorithm does. There's also the maximal rectangles, which is similar to the guillotine uh, <coughs> split, except that when you make a guillotine cut it, in these algorithms, you, you typically just make one cut. But in this case, maximal rectangles keeps track of if you made both cuts along both axes. So I'll, I'll go more into that in a moment. And then there's also the skyline algorithms, which um, keeps track of the skyline. And it, as you can see, there's a little bit of wasted space, but it's a bit more computationally efficient, which is why it's, it's one of the more common algorithms. So just in general, um, with uh, the shelf alg algorithms, um, the free uh, bin is organized into shelves, and it, in convention with all of these 2D packing algorithms, um, it typically goes from, the, the convention to place bins is from bottom left to top right. That's just the convention that I've seen with all these algorithms. And so we use one of the construction heuristics to place the rectangles. <coughs> and so you can use, you can, you can also organize these bins based on height um, or width, and you can place them first fit, best fit, next fit, Ne uh, next fit, worst fit. Um, so that's kind of how those come into play. And <laughs> there's, there's a lot here. There's, as I said, there's, there's shelf next fit, uh, first fit, best width fit, right? Best height fit, best area fit, <laughs> worst fit, and floor ceiling. And, and you can see that they all have um, about the same time complexity and space complexity. Um, and some perform a little better than others, but we can talk about that after if you'd like. Um, so in general, guillotine cuts. Um, the bin is divided into sub-rectangles, and you cut the sub-rectangle from edge to edge. Um, and it's a sort of a divide and conquer algorithm, and um, you can use more variations on the construction heuristics to determine which split to make. And so here's an example of you can either make this cut or this cut, and you can see the remaining area left over depending on which cut you make. So just kind of walking through a guillotine algorithm, um, we, we, these are the order of the bins to place the number, and this is our, our size base. <coughs> so we place the first bin in, bottom most left, we make our guillotine split, so now we have two remaining rectangles, and now we need to fit which, where, where will bin two place, right? Bin two, or uh, sorry, contain object two, object two won't fit in this tiny space, so we have to make a new place, uh, a new spot for it, and make a new cut. And we basically continue on fitting objects as they come and making cuts. Yes? So how do we determine the direction of the cut? For, for the second box, we could also have made a cut in vertical direction, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's um, basically one of the, the kind of subtleties of the guillotine split that I don't really talk about, is um, there are other, other heuristics for deciding which way you make the cut. And I think that typically it has to do with how much remaining free area will be left. Like, if, if you make a cut here, for example, like, uh, I think it, it, like, this area as a whole is bigger, you know, than, like, than if you had made the cut up. Does that make sense? There's a lot of different ways you can choose it. But as I said before, with any of these, there's so many different <coughs> heuristics and choices that you can make. Um, it just depends on what you're in the mood for. Um, so, uh, continuing on, you can see here that all the different cuts are placed, 
until eventually you have all of the bins packed. Um, and then moving on, there's also maximal rectangles, which is similar to the guillotine cut, except that it keeps track of if both cuts have been made. And so in reality, right, you don't actually make these cuts. They're just determining what areas you need to keep track of to fit new objects in. So instead of knowing, you know, that you have, you know, as in the 1D example, you have three or four bins of size seven and you can just fit objects in as they come. You, and you went from having one bin of size, you know, area, to now you have two bins, each of, you know, a fraction of that area. And those are the things that you keep track of. So it gets, it gets pretty expansive quite quickly. Um, and one flavor of these is actually the Tetris algorithm. That's, um, yeah. So maybe you've said that already, but is there uh, some ordering of, uh, in which, uh, where we decide in which order we place the object? So that comes back to the, the construction heuristics, right? So, so all of these still go, they still have their very deep base in the construction heuristics. The first fit, like the first fit, next fit, best fit, worst fit. Those are really the building blocks that all of these are based off of. These are just ways that we expand upon those to put them in two dimensions and three dimensions. Um, and then there's also the skyline algorithm um, where it maintains a list of the, the edge space um, but it can't perfectly keep track of the free areas, um, so you can see here that there is some wasted space. But, inst but uh, instead of dividing the bin into leftover like rectangles, it just keeps track of the remaining area via the skyline of it. And so it's a bit faster than maximal rectangles, but you will have a little bit more wasted space. Um, so just kind of as a summary, shelf algorithms, you basically define shelves and you try to pack all of the objects onto those shelves. Uh, guillotine algorithms, instead of defining shelves, you make cuts along the, um, uh, along the space to pack bins in where they fit. Um, maximal <coughs> rectangles, you place objects in, uh, in the sub-rectangles, you kind of make the dual guillotine cut to keep track of all the different possible places you could put new objects. And then skyline algorithms just keeps track of the skyline to figure out where you can place new objects. Um, and just in general, Maximal rectangles performs the best, uh, like in, in terms of, of the full scope for, from the review papers that I've seen. Skyline algorithms perform the fastest, especially in simpler cases. Shelf algorithms are great if you want to implement something simply, but they're not the best in terms of runtime. Um, and then guillotine algorithms are just a little bit worse than maximal rectangles. Um, so, uh, yeah, so then Skylar's going to take over here. Yeah, so, um, so this is all for uh, packing rectangles, but if you uh, have a more complex situation, you may have to pack something else, like arbitrary shapes. So th this is a common case where this occurs is um, in CNC, like imagine you're laser cutting something, you want to minimize the amount of wasted material while cutting some fairly arbitrary, potentially, shapes out of some object. So. Um, this is an uh, illustration of one of the results of one of the algorithms, we're going to, well, the algorithm we're going to look at. Here you're filling these letters into these arbitrary shapes. So these are, unlike the 2D box case, these are generally dependent on <coughs> some sort of uh, generic fairly generic optimization, like these sorts of different types here. Um, we're just going to discuss the genetic algorithm because it's kind of the simplest. But they're also dependent on some more interesting and complicated uh, geometric-based uh, stuff. So we're going to run through an algorithm called SVGNest. Um, so this is based on two different, has two different components essentially, namely ordering the bin, like the objects to put in the containers, which is done with the optimization, and placing each part given where the previous parts have been placed, which is done via a sort of geometric approach. So the core idea for the placing the part centers around <coughs> what's called these uh, no-fit polygons. So the basic idea is this. So imagine that we're grabbing each part at some point, say a cor this corner of this triangle here. And we have, let's say, just one pl previously placed part, this hexagon. So we want, to not, we want to keep the parts as densely packed as possible, so we want them to always be in contact. And we want to, them to not be overlapping, of course. So 
in order to determine where we can place this part, we can just walk the triangle down along the hexagon while keeping it non-overlapping and in contact. So if you imagine here, we go, we can't go in or outwards, but we can go down the edge, then we can go down this edge, then we can go down this edge, and then all the way around. This produces this no-fit polygon. So this, um, we, we call this orbiting. So the, the no-fit polygon, or NFP, is all the possible placements of part, the part, where we're only tracking the position that we're grabbing the part from, um, that maintains contact without being overlapping. So here's another illustration with a pentagon. Now, this is just for one part, where only one part has been previously placed. What if there are multiple parts, as of course there will be? And what if we have to put it inside a bin? Well, as far as the bin goes, then the possible parts are just what's called the inner fit polygon. That is, if we imagine walking this triangle around the inside of the bin, this produces this polygon here. Um, since we're not trying to keep contact with the bin, generally, we're um, concerned with the entire area contained within this inner fit polygon, not just the edge, whereas in the no fit polygon, <coughs> it's just the edge. Oh, uh, yeah? Sorry. Pots only translate. They don't. Yes, we're, we're do, right now we're thinking this is only translating. If you want to deal with rotations, that's with the part ordering, but we'll get into that later. Um, as far as uh, multiple parts, then you can just um, simply look at the union of the no-fit polygons um, inside the, the, the part of the... So you take the union of all the no-fit polygons and then take the intersection of that resulting set with the area of the inner-fit polygon. So this way, if you add a part, it will always be inside the container, it will always be in contact with at least one previously placed part, and it will never overlap with a previously placed part. So in this example here, where we have the two hexagons inside the square container, the inner, sorry, the rectangular container, the inner fit polygon is this rectangle, the um, no fit polygons are these irregular hexagons, They're, the union of the no fit polygons is this green shape here, and the intersection of that with the area of the rectangle is this blue, uh, Cur uh, set, set of line segments there. So, uh, in order to complete the first packing, if you think about it, we're not really going to go into detail, this requires O of n log n no fit polygons. Um, also note that we're not dealing with the issue of how you actually represent the no fit polygons, but you can think there's lots of ways to do it, like just representing these with line segments, say. Um, so, and then you just use some heuristic, again, we're not going to go into much detail into that, as to where inside the possible positions to place each part. You do, have, however, have to optimize the order if you want this to be effective. So imagine this case here. So if you place the big C here last, you're going to have kind of filled up this whole area here first, because the no fit polygon method is going to be packing stuff in tightly. That means that you're going to have to put the C kind of on the outside, which seems like it leaves a lot of wasted space. You kind of want to leave the use this stuff to fill in the C. In short, you want it to look, some, look something like this. So there's a two different two steps we use to this. First, we're going to use the uh, first fit decreasing heuristic we saw in the 1D case. So we want to go from large to small, which you can imagine kind of is like if you have uh, sand, you're first putting in those big piece blocks, and then you're kind of pouring the sand in to fill the little gaps between them. Yeah. So when we say large, do we mean area-wise, or yeah, because you could see basically is large. Uh, you could do like bounding box size or width, or there's a some other thing. And then we're going to optimize the order on top of this using a genetic algorithm. Um. So this does both insertion orders and rotations of the parts. So um. The goals here are to minimize the unplaceable part number number of unplaceable parts, to minimize the number of bins used if we're using multiple bins, and to minimize the width of all placed parts to try to force them into a compressed area. This last one's kind of arbitrary, um, but it's what they pick. Uh, so then, this of course gives us a number of parameters. So that you can use to tweak the algorithm, like how much do you want to take into account space between parts, 
how curve tolerant is your algorithm, which is how, what I was saying, how you want to represent the no-fit polygons, um, how many rotations you want to allow. Adding more is going to lead to better results, but it's going to require more computer time. How big an initial population, what the mutation rate should be, um, whether or not you want to allow placing parts inside the holes of other parts, which if you don't allow it will generally speed things up significantly. Um, and similarly, whether or not you want to explore concave areas, or if you want to first calculate the convex holes of all the parts and then just go around those, which can easily make a much worse solution, but which will be much faster. So, for 2D, these not too complicated algorithms generally do pretty well. But we live in a three-dimensional universe, so we ultimately need to think to some degree about three-dimensional packing. So, this tends to be significantly more complex than the 2D case, just like the 2D case was significantly more complex than the 1D case. So, going back to this, we need to use all of this, essentially. Um, we're going to just focus a bit on the meta-heuristic side of this for now, just to keep things simple. But as, as a brief comment about the construction heuristics, these are you can think of these as often being kind of an extension of the 2D types, like a there's 2D analog the 3D analogies of the shelf of the guillotine, etc. And as you can see here, this is an illustration of the wall building and layer building, which are the 3D analogies of the 2D shelf method. So here we're picking these uh, plane like rectangular planes and then putting objects on top of them, or trying to force them into these rectangular <coughs> walls. And, uh, but what really matters here, most of all, is then going to be the order of the objects. <coughs> and so that's much like in the SVG nest we're going to do with <coughs> meta heuristics. So, the overall way that what meta heuristics do in this case generally is that they're based on some sort of a local optimization. So you have the solutions or set of solutions you make some modifications of them, you compare those with the old ones via some method, you try to pick ones that are better. Um, there's obviously lots of variation, but the core thing that we need to notice is that they're generally based on some sort of conception of a local change and of local information from that change. But there's uh, obviously a lot of different methods, including ant colony optimization, um, which we won't discuss. But, and these can get quite complicated, like there's a deep reinforcement learning based ones, which and I'll say something about why those are necessary, actually. So, probably the simplest is just genetic algorithms, like we saw in the SVG nest. So, an example of this is the paper, a genetic algorithm for the bin packing problem. So, just randomly permute the input set, use the first fit algorithm to evaluate the fitness of solutions, and then use the GA to permute the solutions. This is the simplest, it's also not very good. Somewhat more sophisticated, maybe you could use things like a pattern search. Um, so here the idea is you're going to represent this space as continuous space. So you can imagine like um, there's some work in embedding it, but we won't we'll go into that. Then you're going to search based on this pattern. So you start out at one node, you uh, move to the points in the pattern as you and pick whichever one's best, and then based on whether or not you're approaching a local optima, <coughs> which you can assess based on the difference in, um, in value at the different nodes in the pattern, you can shrink the pattern to zero in on the local optima. So this is uh, nice in that it's not entirely local. So in like say, if you imagine say gradient descent, it's, only, it's totally based on trying to find local optima. This is not like that. If you imagine that you add like a sort of lot of noise to this, but keep the overall amount of very, like the overall sort of function basically the same, this will function basically the same as if it was nice and smooth, which means that for this, it performs much better than a pure gradient descent or, or something like that for this sort of problem. Another example of a more sophisticated meta heuristic you could use is pa uh, particle swarm optimization, <coughs> which, um, so, Ant colony optimization was inspired by the movement of ants. This is inspired by the movements of bird flocks or fish schools. So the idea is you create a swarm of particles, which each have a position and a velocity, and then you ex each one keeps track of its own best found position 
and the swarm overall keeps track of its own best found position. And then each particle is just accelerated towards both its own best found position and the swarm's best found position. So this, it's not quite obvious why just from the description of the algorithm, but as you can kind of see from the video, this generally leads to a sort of explore exploit trade-off. So you know, the different particles will tend to converge to a best one, but there'll be enough variation that they can find better ones. And furthermore, sorry, because they have this velocity, much like with the pattern search, they're not dependent on small local optima. Like, you can think of them as having a sort of energy, and then they won't get trapped in potential wells. Because even if they're being attracted to them, their velocity is enough to push them out of them. Um, but much like pattern search, it's still essentially dependent on local information. Yes? When we say we accelerate them to both of the uh, those positions, this own best found and the swarm's best found position, does that mean it's, it's a sum of the both? Yes. The or linear combination, yes. Um, and so it should be clear that the meta heuristics, be, though they may help, are not going to solve the problem for you. The core reason for this is that we just don't have that much local information in the packing problem. So like, what do we want? We want to figure out which objects we can pack. This is dependent on the set of objects we can pack. Now, if we reorder the objects, well, that's going to change how the, the shelf or guillotine or whatever algorithms perform. So that may change this set of objects. But in a sense, it's still, we're still kind of looking for a global change. Like, if you imagine having to, uh, di if you imagine how the shelf algorithm works, just swapping the order of two parts doesn't seem like it's going to likely to change much. And this gets much worse if you do a continuous embedding. Like, uh, the reordering the parts at least is making some sort of discrete change, but with continuous change this is even worse. And this sort of problem generally affects all types of locally information-based metaheuristics, which includes pretty much all of them. So this problem is not just about finding the right metaheuristic. I mean, you want a good metaheuristic, but you need, uh, you need the construction heuristics too. And, you, and that's also why like, the deep learning-based <coughs> approach is successful sometimes, because here you aren't just dependent on local information. You need a way of generating complex sequences of configuration which are not fundamentally dependent on local information. So. That said, performance in the 3D pin backing problem is actually <coughs> reasonable in some cases. So uh, we found five different classes of benchmark data sets, um, as you can see in these papers. We're just going to look at this one. So um, here, uh, this is a, as of 2016, I believe. Um, <coughs> you can see here the number of different box types. So there's different boxes. This in does include stability considerations, which we haven't said how much space was utilized. So as you can see, these numbers are actually pretty high, like about 90%. And the box number is quite substantial, like up to 100. Um, so the algorithms are capable of doing reasonably well. Um, this is mostly genetic algorithms, taboo search, and tree search. We haven't discussed the last two. But um, so the, we could use a 3D bin pack problem potentially for Mark Watney's problem. Um, this might require some time to find a good solution, but it isn't too worrying because, as we see from the benchmarks, these algorithms, if put together well, can find a decent solution given a fairly small number of boxes. We haven't, and there's also lots of complexities of the 3D packing problem we haven't discussed at all, like irregular shapes, gravity, stability, rotations, more generally geometry. Like, this is all about, everything I said was about packing rectangles into rectangles. The cuboids into cuboids. These are easier to deal with in 2D than they are in 3D generally. So, so as a final summary, um, we Mark Watney could use robotic assistant for a ant colony optimization to aid in disassembling a spaceship, um, or I suppose NASA could use one and then tell them what to do, uh, and they could use a 3D packing of algorithm to op uh, optimally or near optimally modify the rover and pack it the facilities he needs to survive on his like 45 day voyage across Mars to reach the map for launch site. So here are some references. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Well, let me, so let me ask you. So um, 
So at the last part, you were you were talking about the ability to use more than kind of local information. Right? Yes. Um, so if you look in the the literature on body info routing with time limits, right? So if we kind of go to the first part, then then when you were looking at it as a traveling salesman problem, then um, then logistics problems are traveling salesman problems, but they do have constraints, like you guys are dealing with on both sides. Um, and often stochastic local search algorithms, you guys presented a number of stochastic local search algorithms that are used there. They use this other thing where they frame it as a constraint program and they still do a stochastic search, but they're doing what's called large neighborhood search. So I was wondering whether or not you guys saw in your literature survey um, large neighborhood search, and if so, whether or not, how does that address kind of the global issues that you were talking about, and how does it compare to some of these other methods? Let's come to all of you. So, Kind of like what I said before is that any combination, possibly, you know, of, of like algorithms and heuristics and stuff, has like probably been implemented. And I do remember reading something about like the neighborhood search, but it didn't seem quite as talked about in the literature. It was kind of, it, you know, it kind of seemed like a very small paragraph in the large scheme of things. So I didn't like really, really focus on. Mm -hmm. on it. So like No 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 that's 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 fine. Some of this is which community you dove into. Right. Let me just say a, a few words about that, right? Which which is which is a lot of the the community looks like you're kind of draw from what they'll do is they'll take the sub problem, they'll design an algorithm for that sub problem right? and then they do it over and over again and if you a company comes up with a new sub problem then you say hire three PhDs and give me four years and do it. So the constraint programming community which tends to be more of let me give you a language and you frame the problem in the language have been trying to advocate an alternative approach where you frame it as a constraint program <coughs> and then you do local search. But the prob then the problem ends up being is if you do stochastic local search, like a number of your algorithms, then you have this local problem. So the idea in large neighborhood search is that you get the system to be able to look over a large neighborhood of jumps as opposed to a small neighborhood of jumps while still in your constraints. Mm -hmm. I, it seems like they're mostly the papers we saw for the impacting at least were mostly just looking elsewhere for their meta heuristics. Like they were more like, like we looked at these meta heuristics and tried applying them, not like we tried to design a meta heuristic for this problem. So uh, I think they mostly were just looking at the ones that are most commonly used, which do tend to be these sort of stochastic local searches. Um, I mean, across all problems, not for impacting specifically. So. Uh, other questions? Yes. There was this SVG nest. On many slides, what is, what is the, the, the screen? Oh yeah, that's just the local of the out, like the algorithm, basically, like the the software that did it, right? What's the question? So is that, is that a package? That, that was this SVG nest. <coughs> Your slides have SVG. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the that's the logo for the open source um, nesting software. So you can go on to GitHub and basically see all of this information. Okay. We just found that their explanations were really interesting and accessible. Yeah. Um, so this is just like one, like there are a lot of other, uh, um, like you can buy software that does nesting. Um, this is just an open source one that we found that had like a really good explanation and like good like citations. So we thought we'd bring it up. That's just the logo for it. Cool. Yeah. Did you find any algorithms for the packing problem that kind of incorporate time? So like, kind of like the piano movers problem? Or, so at the moment you've been kind of looking at just like putting things in a box as though they instantly appear there, but you know, there might be a configuration where you can't get, for example, the C. Mm -hmm. And I, I would imagine you could kind of incorporate some of the stuff in the first slide. Did you see anything like that? So with that flavor of time, I don't think I really recall any mm -hmm. packing with with the time as being like a constraint. It's more like, can you plan online or do you have to plan offline? Does it yeah. going to take you 10 minutes or will it be done in 30 seconds? It, that's like really the main application of time. I guess I mean more in terms of the ordering of. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. I see. I see exactly what you're saying. Like, will this part be available like in, in five yeah. minutes, or if if we put it in and then it squishes or something like that over time? Like, I, I think I see what you're saying. Um, I just didn't okay. see anything um, mm -hmm. with that. And and there might be. It's just that our our main sources for a lot of this were some like three or four really good like survey papers as like the main basis for a lot of this. So it's. It's possible, you know, that's kind of why the asterisk goes, there's probably something, is a very well studied field. Mm -hmm. Yes? Did you come across something where we can model the constraints, how accessible things are? So for example, in 
in the engine bay area of a car, the bigger the engine gets, the more you have to move to do small repairs. For Is there any way to model how the mechanic can, where it can access things with his hands? Um, for the uh, net client position? Sorry? Are you talking about for the assembly planning? Yeah. This, uh, yeah. No. I think so. Part of the issue there is is um, it would be included in the disassembly matrix because that specifically encodes whether one part can move to from another part mm -hmm. if these parts are present. So when you, if you're doing that, you'd have to include the mechanics hands mm -hmm. in the when you design the disassembly matrix when you design the constraints there. That has a block basically, right? Uh, yeah, How, or, the, or whatever tool the robotic arm has. Right. Or like if you think about, like basically what you're saying, right, if you have a screw that can technically be moved in the Z direction, but if you, but if there's, you know, the shell of the car, right, yeah. the frame of the car, <coughs> so you're, the worker can't actually move it yeah. in the Z direction if the frame of the car is there, I think that's what it would have to be taken into account with the disassembly matrix. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. Okay, good. So, thank you very much. Yeah.